shift the existing position by re-engaging them in new ways. So as I mentioned, some examples might be a storyline, might be staffing policies, um, what we see in the curriculum, racialized narratives of intelligence, some positions that might exist, ways that people are talked about in a particular school space as an IB pin. People know what IB is, International Baccalaureate. Um, a repeater, someone who's failed in the past and taken a class again. Um, or someone might be seen in a classroom space as a contributor of valuable ideas. Some of these positions are more institutional and some of them are more locally figured, right, in a classroom itself. An active positioning could include the volunteering of an idea, it's called reflexive because I volunteered the idea, I'm positioning myself as having an idea, or the validating of that idea by another. Shelly might say, wow, that's such a good idea. She's positioned me as a person with good ideas. Hmm. Um, I have some turn and talks embedded in here. Do people want to engage in some turn and talks? Or should I just like, yeah. Okay. Own it. Own it. Well, I'm not going to have turn and talks in my job talk, but I think um, it's valuable to just take a moment and think about how do you see identity at play in your own learning spaces right now? We can take just a few minutes because, you know, this is like a forever talk. Like three minutes. Classrooms 
holding all these different building blocks, right? The building blocks are the storyline. And they have different shapes and sizes, and they're figuring out how to put them together into a cohesive and coherent sense of self. But at any given moment, they might reorganize it. And depending on the spaces that they're traversing over the course of the day, over the course of the year, they may be asked to reorganize those blocks really significantly. Um, they may come into a classroom and the teacher hands them a new block, right, to work with, and they have to figure out where does it fit. Um, and the, I think of the role of teachers in this process as both supporting young people as they figure out how to put these blocks together, as well as potentially offering new blocks, hopefully ones that um, resonate and are generative to them, but of course it could be, you know, a bumbling act in which we knock things down, um, or a block that really doesn't have a place right now. So this is sort of a, a visual metaphor that I find useful and productive. The title of the talk is around the stakes of being seen and heard, and Really, I've been thinking about the role of visibility in um, how identity becomes consequential to learning and how learning becomes consequential to identity. If we consider positioning theory as a way of thinking about identity, our identity and our learning um, requires us to become visible in some sort of way in our competence and in our participation much of the time. Um, in the school site where I spent a year last year, there was a way in which mathematical competence was understood differently from in many spaces. It was understood as participation, as demonstrating effort, as um, being able to explain to others and explain your own thinking, which is different from many spaces where mathematical competence is understood as um, speed, accuracy, efficiency. Um, so I wanted to dig in a little bit more about to visibility, if visibility acts as a proxy for perceived competence, like what other work is it doing? Oftentimes in order to be seen as legitimate in a particular identity, again, it needs to become visible in front of others. The challenge here is that when we position ourselves in a particular way, um, it requires being seen and heard by others mm -hmm. in a way that they already understand. So there's a question of recognition as a known entity. If I am just a brilliant mathematician, but I am acting my brilliance in a way that you don't recognize as math, then it doesn't matter. Um, so there's a question of recognition and legibility. Um, and then I also want us to think about questions of invisibility and hypervisibility. These are constructs that are particularly important when thinking um, about students of color and about students with disabilities. So hypervisibility and invisibility come out of our constructs that um, Patricia Hill Collins, a black feminist, the black feminist think, scholar, um, of many, but you know, she's real important, is asking us to recognize what happens when someone becomes hypervisible. And on the other flip side of that coin, what becomes invisible. This is also a challenge for many students with disabilities, where sometimes disability is invisible and is therefore not supported, and other times it becomes hypervisible and becomes constructed as a problem. tell you about my research a little bit. Um, I spent over a year at participating in the community of Sierra High School, which is a Bay Area predominantly Latinx serving institution. Um, I spent almost every day in Ms. Warren's classroom, every day that the class met, almost I was there. Um, and I spent a lot of time getting to know and following, shadowing, moving with students through their different spaces. So Maple and Giselle are two students I'm gonna talk about today. Um, my research really asks questions about what was going on at all of these levels, but I'm gonna focus today at Maple and Giselle's personal experience, sort of. 
it's going to take us a minute to get here. Um, so at the high school level, I was asking, how do how are dominant storylines around mathematical competence circulated and reproduced at the high school level? And what kinds of counter narratives existed that challenged those dominant storylines and how were those produced? This is a school that's very committed to equity um, and in particular in its math department. At the level of Ms. Long's classroom, I was asking about what storylines made identities of competence available in Ms. Long's classroom. Again, this was a classroom space that was really exciting for some of the um, teaching practices that were happening there, allowing many students who had previously failed to participate in different ways and to pass the course. Um, and at the same time, there were challenges. So what challenges existed to student inhabitants of identities of competence? And then finally, at the student level, I was asking how did students actually inhabit and become visible in these identities of mathematical competence, and again, what were the challenges that they faced? So my work brings together ethnography and social interaction analysis. Ethnography um, entails being deeply embedded in a space over a long period of time and participating as a member of the community and as a researcher. And by doing ethnography, it really allowed me to look at this cross-spatial production of these storylines and how they were being taken up by students as they moved across the spaces. Social interaction analysis oftentimes zooms in to these moment-to-moment -moment interactions, um, and that's where I was looking at these acts of positioning. And by bringing the two together, I'm able to trace the acts of positioning themselves in the context of these broader storylines that are being produced and reproduced at the high school level, at the classroom level, and then between students. said a little bit about this already. The context is a predominantly Latinx survey institution located in the highly stratified um, region of California. The math department was using, loosely using CPM curriculum, which is a progressive student thinking centered curriculum, um, and was broadly committed to discourse-based mathematics in their classroom. And the focal class, Ms. Wong's classroom, um, was an integrated math one course, which means it's the first course that students were supposed to take upon arriving to high school unless they were somehow already accelerated. Um, Ms. Wong was a second year teacher who had was re recruited to do this work with me because of her stated commitment to equity and her participation in communities that were pursuing critical pedagogy and social justice uh, beyond the space of her school. And the classroom, there were 20 fully participating students in the study, so there were over 38 students who moved through this classroom at some point during the year, but 20 who participated. Um, and those students were in grades nine to 12, which is significant because this is an integrated math one class. Um, over the course of the year, I observed and participated in spaces throughout the school, including every math classroom, um, and collected all sorts of different <coughs> artifacts through the school, and I participated daily in the focal classroom where I took field notes, which is what the essence of my analysis is coming from today. Um, I also collected video in the focal classroom and interviewed teachers and students and conducted focus groups with students across grades and classes, so not just in the focal classroom. So even these are sort of small findings from the other levels because it matters to understanding what's going on in the focal classroom. Um, at the high school level, some of the dominant storylines that were being reproduced were around the underrepresentation of Latinx students in upper level math courses, um, as well as this idea that smartness and ability is racialized as white. I'll say a little bit more about that in a moment. Um, at the same time, there are counter narratives, so there's widespread access to resources at this historically under-resourced um, institution, including one-to-one -one technology. Every student had a laptop. Um, IB <coughs> diplomas were available as one of the only schools in the country that's predominantly Latinx serving that offers IB diploma. Um, and as I mentioned before, mathematical competence was really understood to include participation, effort, ability to explain and support others. I want to point out some of the 
complexity around visibility that comes up at this point in terms of underrepresentation of Latinx students in other level courses. And this is from a field note, don't read the whole thing, um, of my conversation with the principal in which I brought up the question of um, underrepresentation of Latinx students in upper level courses. And at first she pushed back and said, oh no, that's actually not true. That's just the student perception. And then she said, actually it is true in math, but it's not true in history. Um, and so what they do, she explains that they even, she's worried about the perception of students that Latinx students don't take IB courses. So she says, they even try to take incoming students around to the classes and visit the IB history course, for example, so that students can see for themselves that Latinx students are a majority of the students in the class. So there's a question of visibility and being seen, right, in this upper level course. Um, I wanna contrast that or put that, juxtapose that with two interviews that I had with students in which students who identified as Mexican, um, but then also hesitatingly identified as maybe I'm also white, um, spoke about what that meant to them. One student said, they had expectations for me to drop out and not go to school because Mexican or whatever. And then like whenever I would come to school or whenever they'd be like, oh, you're white um, because I'm doing my work. So what happens if when someone is in an IB history course, they are then seen as white? And we're trying to take students around to see that there are Latinx students in the IB history course. So this is um, what Elizabeth Pelzinelli sort of called the cunning of recognition. We get um, caught in the storylines that already exist and it changes how things become visible. So Ms. Wong's classroom was a really exciting place. It was a place where there were tasks with multiple solution pathways and rich context. There was varied participation structures that allowed for revision of ideas and lower the risk for public sharing. There was emphasis on participation as connected to the political world beyond the classroom, such as in a, in a democracy. And there was emphasis on everyone being both a teacher and a learner. This is an image from the classroom. You can see students are seated um, generally in groups of four, and there's a student leading the class right now um, explaining some of his work. There's other student work that's been discussed on the board, and the teacher is sort of off to the side as the student leads the conversation. At the same time, there were challenges that existed to students seeing themselves as mathematically competent in this space including the storylines I just laid out at the school level, right? Plus, um, histories of failure, remediation, and segregation um, of students in the class. 50% of the students in this class were ninth graders in the 20 participating students. 50% are ninth graders and 50% are students from other grade levels, eight of whom had previously failed the course at least once, three of whom had failed the course twice, and the two other students who were not ninth graders were in a ninth grade course after having been in segregated um, special ed classes for between two and three years um, doing sixth, seventh, and eighth grade math before they were um, invited to be in this class. So grades and test scores continue to be a form through which students judge their own competence. Um, mental and physical health and attendance affected students' participation and visibility, and this sort of tension between being cool and doing school, which any of us who have been educators um, probably have seen in our own classroom spaces, or who have been students. Um, this is a little demographic breakdown of the classroom. So as I pointed out, there was a distribution between 9th, 10th, 11th, and 12th grade. Um, the classroom is predominantly Latinx with two black students two white students and three students who were of various mixed races. Um, and one student with an IEP in each of the four grades. So returning to this 
focal, these looking at student trajectories. I really want to look at how individual students were inhabiting and becoming visible in these identities of mathematical competence and what kinds of challenges they faced. So in order to do that, I coded all of my field notes, so 68 days of field notes from 100 minute class series, um, for their interactional context, specifically looking at whole class instruction and breaking whole class instruction out into chosen versus nominated forms of visibility, which I'll share that in just a moment. I also coded for all these other things that hopefully I'll use later, but is not the analysis that I'm sharing here. Um, and then I coded for who are the students present in each interaction. In my analysis phase, I cleaned the data, making sure that I wasn't just pulling things that were overlapping for meaningless reasons. Um, and I wrote a memo for every instance of whole class visibility by student. So that's all 20 students, every single instance of their visibility. So that was 656 memos. Um, and in those memos, I included what the context was of that visibility. Was it a mathematical or non-mathematical um, contribution? And how was the student received? So was, were they positioned as competent or was their um, contribution positioned as valuable? Who was doing the positioning themselves or someone else? And specifically also a teacher, was it by a teacher, a student, or someone else? I then summarized visibility by student and by semester because I was interested in the breakdown of things over time, looking at chosen versus nominated visibility and then chosen visibility broke it out by math and non-math. I summarized visibility by student by unit and then finally, I'm going to share some spotlights on two students. And those spotlights come not only from my field notes, but also from the interviews, from end of course surveys, and from um, the memos that I constructed. So some of the high level findings here are that when students had higher levels of visibility, it was correlated with positive course outcomes. Okay, but this wasn't true across the board, but it was strongly correlated. Um, student trajectories of visibility, however, were neither linear nor constant. So they changed, they went up, they went down. Um, when students had high levels of visibility, they also usually had higher rates of chosen visibility, which I'll speak about a little bit more. And students with histories of failure and or academic segregation, usually due to an IEP, chose non-mathematical forms of visibility more than other students, at least earlier on in the year. So I'm going to show a little bit of each of these. This is a matrix showing um, course outcomes by visibility. So visibility is on the y-axis and course outcomes is on the x-axis with passing and failing. Um, high visibility based on the median and low visibility, so above the median or below the median. Um, and what you can see is that no student who had high visibility failed the course. Um, there are 10 students who had high visibility and passed, six students who had low visibility and failed, and then these four students who had low visibility but passed the course. That's for the fall semester. In the spring semester, the numbers are exactly the same. And are the kids the same? But students are not the same. Um, so, let me help you read this a little bit. I know it's hard to see the names, but more important than the names is the color. So students who are in white stayed from semester one to semester two um, in the quadrant that they were previously in. Students who are in black dropped from one quadrant to another from semester one to semester two. So Scott, Maple, Ray, and Gabriel. Um, Scott and Ray move all the way from high and passing to low and failing. Um, Gabriel actually leaves the school in the middle of mm. the second semester, so that's why he's low visibility and mm -hmm. not passing the course. Um, and then Maple moves from high visibility passing to low visibility passing. We're going to talk a little more about her trajectory. Mm. And then you can't see, but the yellow students in yellow <coughs> increase in visibility in, mm -hmm. and change quadrants. Um, so, Walker, Brian, and Michael, who all failed the course in the fall, passed in the spring. Um, you can see Mike.
Michael is actually the highest level of his ability in the course in the spring. He was new to the class in the fall, but not to the school. He moved sections, failed the fall, the fall semester, and in the spring semester became the most visible and passing student. Um, and then Raquel and Angelica moved from low visibility to higher visibility in the course. I wanted to make the distinction in my analysis between nominated and chosen visibility in order to think about chosen as a reflexive form of positioning and nominated as someone else positioning you. Um, nominated visibility was coded for any time a teacher would call on a student or the teacher would reference a student's idea, right? So even if I didn't call on you, I might say, um, Sharon had a really great idea, let's consider it. Or Sharon had an idea, let's consider Sharon to work. Um, or if a student, their ideas or their work or performance was mentioned by another student, right? Um, I use Stephanie's idea in my work. A chosen visibility included a student volunteering to respond to a teacher prompt. So if a teacher asks for volunteers, the student responds. A student participating during sort of a call and response activity where the teacher just asks this broad question where everybody's really supposed to answer, but only some students do um, calling out in that context. Or if a student just asks an unsolicited question or made an unsolicited comment. Why are we doing this? Um, when's our test? So this is a breakdown from the fall semester and the spring semester of chosen versus nominated visibility. It's a breakdown by student. Um, chosen is in green and nominated is in blue. And one of the things I want to point out here is that there's two things I want to point out. Students who chose to be visible in the fall semester um, were the most visible students. Students who chose to be visible in the fall semester were also almost predominantly either students with IEPs or students who are not ninth graders. These are students who are finding a place in the course in a proactive manner, um, while the sort of new ninth graders perhaps were hanging back a little bit more, or this could be understood in a number of ways. Um, but the students who had taken the course before or who had IEPs were finding ways to be visible. In the spring semester, not everybody, but for most people, these ratios become a little bit closer to one. We don't see as much um, sort of over-representation of chosen versus nominated visibility. And I want to suggest that that's because the teacher um, started using practices. The teacher noticed that the same people were consistently participating when volunteers were asked for and started using practices to distribute participation a little bit more. The other thing that's really interesting is that not all visibility was math related, right? Math related visibility might be a teacher calls on a student to share their idea or a student volunteers to share a definition, but students also found ways to participate in the class that weren't math related, right? They became visible for other reasons. I very explicitly excluded behavior from my analysis, so that's not what I mean here. I'm talking about students volunteering to read the question, students volunteering to stand up and hold the string while we model something, um, or a teacher calling on a student to share something that they learned about their new group member because they were doing a culture building activity. When we look at chosen visibility, being math or non-math, the students who have the highest ratio of non-math participation, again, the top two, um, Ray and Bella, are students with IEPs. Um, but, what, but they have some of the higher levels of chosen visibility. So what I wanna suggest here is that 
students were given opportunities and finding ways to become visible in the classroom, understanding that that was important for them, but in ways that were lower risk, right? That were not necessarily mathematical at this point. However, much of that decreases into spring semester, suggesting that students found more mathematical ways to participate. Okay, hold on to your horses, because we've <laughs> <laughs> all been waiting to <laughs> these two students because they both had the highest level of visibility at one point in one unit, the mm -hmm. first and the last unit of the year. They're both female identifying. They both had IEPs. Mm -hmm. They both passed both fall and spring semester of the course. I really wanted to focus on success stories of an entry point, um, although I am also interested in how failure happens. Um, they have very distinct trajectories of visibility. One increasing and the other one decreasing. And each of them captures certain dynamics of the classroom space, um, both things that are particular to them and other things that are common. I'm gonna start out by talking about Gisela. Um, Gisela is a 10th grader. She's female identifying and referred to herself as Hispanic, had an IEP, she had transferred from another high school in the area and reported feeling more comfortable at Sierra. Um, she was frequently absent in the prior year, and she was oftentimes absent for extended periods of time um, in the year of the study as well. In my field notes, I wrote about Gisela as um, she has amazing fake eyelashes and lots of heavy eyeshadow and is shyly pleased with herself when she provides an explanation to a problem. She's pretty stylish. She's pretty fashionable for the, for the school. Um, I'm gonna spotlight four different moments in Gisela's year. At the beginning of the year, um, 
salad of bread for herself as the dumb one. She does this multiple times, mm -hmm. actually. Mm -hmm. And I want to suggest that this is strongly drawing on narratives of disability and of being um, segregated and deemed to disability. So this is one day we're working, I'm working in a group with her and another student, and the other student starts by copying her. And I suggest, let's take turns and I encourage uh, her to have James start the next one. And she asks some questions. What do you see? How do you know that? Okay, explain. And I give James a hard time asking if he's just going to listen to everything Gisela says, trying to encourage him to engage on his own terms rather than copying. She says, come on, James, I'm the dumb one at this mm -hmm. table. That's particularly interesting because she is inhabiting an identity of, of teacher, right, in asking these very um, provocative and supportive questions, and yet at the same time explicitly positions herself as the dumb one. Moving forward in the year, she starts to become more aware of herself as a person with competence. Um, she's working in a group with an 11th grader named Scott. We call him Paul Scott. Um, and they, I'm starting sort of in the middle here, they get stuck on one problem and call out to Ms. Long, and I turn to check in with them and tell them they can write the equation this time to find the slope. Gisela exclaims, that's how she had written it already. She rewrites something that she had just erased. They get stuck again and check in with me about the next step, which involves subtracting from both sides to isolate n. Gisela says to Scott, see, I told you so. She continues, how did I steal the brain? You're supposed to be the one with the brain. Scott counters, no, I'm just lazy. Scott turns to working on finding the slope from two points, and he does, and then I ask him, so what did you find? And he says, he doesn't know. Gabby says, it's the slope. Mm -hmm. um, so not only now is Gabby um, positioning herself with knowledge, but she's also noticing herself as competent, right? How did I steal the brain? I wasn't, wasn't expecting it to be me. She had just erased her, her work um, and is finding out that, oh, twice now, I had an idea and it was, it was correct. From semester one to semester two, Gisela's participation and her ideas are being recognized publicly. Um, and I want to suggest that this is not just her own doing, but also the teacher starts to nominate her and make her visible. In one moment, she puts, um, Ms. Wong puts Gisela's work on the board um, and says, check your answers with Gisela's. In another moment, she says, Raise your hand if, you're, if your triangle looks like my triangle. Great. Gisela, how did you do that? Gisela explains. She saw the point and went to the negative. Miss Long says, raise your hand if you also did it this way, where you saw the point and made it negative. And one student raises his hand, and she's like, that's a great method. Um, and a little bit later on in the same unit, Miss Long tells Gisela she's going to steal her paper, and she puts Gisela's work on the document camera. Check your answers with Gisela's. I really like this because she's labeled all her points. I saw a couple of people put A prime over here, so check your work. Right? She's not only positioning Gisela as having um, correct answers, but she's even comparing her to some other students who had made careless errors. So look at how Gisela's chosen visibility shift. She goes from having a predominantly non-mathematical forms of chosen visibility to being predominantly mathematical forms of chosen visibility. We can really see her enacting mathematical competence in the ways that she's visible. Um, and in her end of year exit ticket, she says, uh, exit ticket, survey, she says, my views on math has changed. I love math. I love solving problems because it feels like a puzzle. I learned that nothing is hard if you keep asking questions and staying after school or class. We have about 10 minutes left together. Do we want to stop and do questions? Um, do we want to talk about maple? Let's hear a little about maple. Okay, so maple has this plummeting trajectory of disability. She's a ninth grader. She's female identifying, called, explains herself as white and Japanese, has an IEP, and she is 
the student that consistently finishes and submits their assessments before everyone else. Um, in describing what she's wearing, I have noted in my field notes, only Maple is wearing green. Green was not really a cool color that year. Um, and she's very artistic. She's working with some clay, maybe plasticine. She's making a hand. Um, the very first day of school, this field note is from the very first, like, 20 minutes of the very first day. The bell goes off and Ms. Wong welcomes the class. She asks if anyone thought about a response to the question posted on the board. If a bat and a ball cost a dollar ten, and the bat costs a dollar more than the ball, how much does the ball cost? One student's hand shoots up and she provides a long, clear explanation of her thinking, which starts with the answer and then explicates the process, including her initial idea and how she revised it. She's serious and sincere, and I can hear a student on the opposite side of the room snickering slightly at Mrs. Wong, Ms. Wong shushing him. The girl's name is Maple. Ms. Wong points out that she really liked that Maple explained her process, saying that at first she thought one thing and then she changed her thinking. Ms. Wong also shares that 80% of college students get this problem wrong. So in this moment, Maple becomes visible in a pretty high risk situation. It's the first day of school, it's the first 10 minutes of class, um, Ms. Wong appreciates her visibility, validating it, positioning it with competence, and then perhaps makes an error here in positioning Maple as more mathematically competent than 80% of college students, um, which gets taken up by students in the class um, along the storyline of Maple not really belonging in this classroom. And next time that Maple participates, a student next time, but one of the following times that she participates, a student raises his hand and asks if someone was really smart if they could move up to a higher class. He insists that it was a compliment and not something rude, and reiterates again that maybe if someone really smart, they should move to another class. Um, and the teacher pushes back on this pretty explicitly, but this is a very explicit challenge to Maple's belonging in this classroom. And again, I think pushing on the narrative of um, disability as not belonging, standing out, exceptional, but not in a good way. Maple's visibility plummets, um, both because she realizes she's being received badly, but also because her teacher realizes that her visibility has become negatively um, constructed and stops making her visible as often. But Maple finds what I want to share is that Mabel finds ways to participate in this classroom that are on different terms, that don't involve being public during full class instruction, but that instead involve um, working with other, on a group level and participating with other students in that way. And she finds a place in this classroom where she's recognized as um, perhaps different, but on terms of, of inclusiveness as opposed to um, being an abstract. So another student asks her for support, does or doesn't take up her idea and then sort of says, oh, she's so chill. She's just calm, no emotions. I have a lot of emotions in my field. Mm -hmm. um, and at the end of the year, perhaps surprisingly, Maple points out that it really was her classmates mm -hmm. that supported her throughout the year, helping her figure out concepts that she didn't quite grasp easily. <coughs> Fascinating, given that she's the person who stands out as so consistently understanding what's going on. Um, and not always being well received by her classmates, but she has perceived it um, as really supporting her. And she celebrates with me at the very end of the year by giving me this um, paper print. It says, the cool thing is that no one is the same as the next. And the one she has made me is unique, just like me. Suggesting her value of uniqueness, um, both in me, but also in herself having found this, this place of, a space of belonging, even if it's on this different term. Implications for practice, um, being seen and heard matters. But the types of opportunities and the sort of light in which one is seen and heard shape the implications of being visible. And some forms of participation and consciousness are left invisible, so what are those and how might they be validated?
about the religious admissions and the national experience of being nominated and choosing. <clears throat> so did you see anything with <clears throat> where if the teacher nominated, they would they started choosing to be recognized? Or where they, like in the case of Maple, where she volunteered, she chose to be the teacher. So like if one thing happened that was a precursor yeah. to the other, that's fascinating. I had not looked at that. Oh, I have it written down. <laughs> <laughs> So the teacher and I continue to work together and create our terms and progressions together soon around some of the classroom practices that I think supported the positive outcomes in terms of identity um, uptake. So I think we heard about opportunities she provided. Um, but one of the really interesting ones is the chosen opportunity. The times where people chose to participate were very frequently in response to a prompt from her that was along the lines of, um, sorry, this is weird. Like, raise your hand if you had a different way of doing it. Um, if, try, did I, this one really, it was the one where most chosen participation happened, which is a really fascinating um, way of framing and inviting voices into the classroom because what it did was say, we have one way, but we need more, and difference was actually the terms on which people were choosing to participate. Mm -hmm. Sorry, this was a draft slide, but. <laughs> and I haven't, um, I presented findings that are more related to the teacher practices and the classroom practices, um, or like the level two, to the whole school community um, at the end of the year, and also parts of like student interviews for the math department around in particular the ways that students were perceiving like mathematical competence. Like the question, how do you know if someone's good at math? Um, how do you know if you're good at math? How did they know? The teachers? Mm -hmm. The teachers were really, really wanting to understand how to support the social world and social identities of their students better. Um, I think one question that came up that was really important was what about students that don't feel comfortable being visible? Like very explicitly about, um, you know, these, these four. Okay, how do these students get recognized um, and have a place in my classroom if visibility, especially in whole class participation, is not something that they are interested in or feel comfortable with? Mm -hmm. another question. I know it's, it's beyond the scope of study, but I'm also interested because you said you very explicitly excluded interactions related to discipline. Um, but obviously that very much still exists in like context of school, and I'm just curious if you can speak to how that potentially affected findings or in the school or... Mm -hmm. um, yeah. I... It changes a few students place of visibility, but not that dramatically. Um, and it's certainly, there, there are a couple of students whose paths I really want to trace closely who failed in the fall and passed in the spring. So in particular, um, Walker and Brian, who are the two students in the class who have the highest level of uh, behavioral visibility, who but there's something that I'm really interested in about how they became visible and stayed visible, being part of how they um, were recruited into the classroom. The teacher put a lot of energy and effort into addressing them in all different ways, um, and they went from failing to passing over the course of the two semesters, um, whereas they could have become invisible and probably would have stayed I will go there. I just haven't yet. 
Um, at the beginning, you mentioned um, like intelligence seen as like white. Um, it's actually really interesting. I had my my younger brother went to like a like I guess like a remedial high school um, after he was kicked out of like the normal high school. And so I would try and help him with his math homework, and he would say like he would just be like, "No, dude, I can't do it. I'm not fancy like you." Mm -hmm. And I would ask him like, "Oh, like what? Well, what is fancy?" He's like, "I'm just not privileged. I can't think about it like how you can." Um, and so I was just wondering like how you saw that like was it in their conversation between students did they like identify um with like like being like oh like i don't know i can imagine what the conversation would look like because i can imagine my brother talking like that so i was wondering if you saw that in the classroom a lot um, um so given the options that i went into this study with um like I officially started collecting data in the social classes with the same teachers that the year before. Um, there was a really interesting interaction in which a student says, um, he, he, he calls out, out of turn, you know, and is correct, and then turns and says, like, I'm smart, you're a racist, um, to the person next to him, right? With this presumption of you were presuming that I wasn't smart mm. as a minor, right? Um, then he's pushing back again. Um, there are certainly, there's another instance where a, a student uh, talks about having a, being well positioned in his classroom because he's got a telepathic connection with his teacher because they're both Asian. Um, but the two examples I, sh oh, and the student who said to me, you know, people just assume I'm smart. They say I look smart. I'm like, what does that mean, you look smart? And she really, really hesitated and like wore it. And I was like, what, do, what does, what, why do people say that to you? Like, what does it mean you look smart? And she was like, it's because they think I'm white, right? And it took like a lot of pushing because there's this uh, idea that you're not supposed to speak to that. Um, so it wasn't always as explicit as So specifically, Gisela, mm -hmm. who she's the one whose trajectory went up so much. I'm interested in like, did she verbalize? She clearly, like in the discussion, said that she was getting brain. Like she, she was realizing that she was really smart. Mm -hmm. Did you see her see that in only a positive way, or was there? the same kind of like negotiation around, oh my gosh, like are people gonna question me? It was only in a positive light as far as I could tell with her. I mean, she she still was like struggling to pass the course. Mm -hmm. um, so it's not like she went from being someone who had to work really hard to like it coming really easy and her like stomping all over everyone else with her brilliance. But she was actively like helping other students towards the end of the year, like reaching out to students who were really struggling and supporting them. Um, it's also worth mentioning that there was a special ed aide in this classroom at the beginning of the year who got pulled from the classroom because there was nothing to do. Like because the classroom was organized in such a manner that the aide was like students were supposed to support each other and they were supporting each other and the aide couldn't figure out how to participate and so she was placed in another thing. Um, so my follow-up question is like, I think that that is wonderful and amazing and I'm wondering how can we interrogate this idea of like smartness being equated to whiteness through like the eyes of what, what is it about like certain types of smartness maybe that are equated to whiteness and other types of smartness um, or like positive performance that are acceptable mm -hmm. in different social contexts? Like what does, is it like, like 
recognition from authority that makes smartness equal whiteness. So like this, the IB class, that people, like you're taking um, students around, it's like, oh, well, those are white students now. And then versus Gisela, what you just described, it's like she used her smartness for like her community, for like helping others within her community. Like, so. I love it. Um, I'm gonna suggest that you and I both read work on whiteness as property and continue to answer that question. <laughs> Thank you everyone so, so, so much. Yeah. Yeah, that's what I was. Oh, cool. Back in 2007, yeah. Oh, I love that sounds. Yeah. Yeah. Did you take just with the other class while you I think it had started, yeah, yeah. but I didn't. Oh, okay. Yeah. Everyone always talks about that. That's true. Yeah. 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 Good. How's life after that? Uh, good. We had a really. How big is your cohort? Yeah. Um, yeah, our first was like 13, I think. So, uh, oh, wow. and then one of one of the guys in the cohort was part of it. We're around. We're working somehow working full time on people. Uh, I have no idea how to get it. Um, um, and we just went all, you know, we're all in different places, but yeah, yeah it seems hard to be about it. Which I really like. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. 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 Good. And we were lucky to have Karen. Karen was not the head of not in charge when I was there. I mean, which is not a complaint about the person who was in charge, but I just watched the program grow so beautifully. And Karen's so good at bringing up resources. Yeah. Was she like a PhD student? Yeah, I think she was finishing up her doctor or something. Oh, okay. I don't know. Have you been? Good. Yes. Good. So I miss it like a year. Yeah. I'll be with you. Yeah. 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 Oh, no. I think it's the last time I saw you. Yeah. 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 I was at Expo. I think that's right. Yeah. 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 And, yeah. and, and yeah. I sometimes come to some of the other ones. Besides this, like the ride of the past mile. Yeah. 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 Yeah.